China, the sleeping giant that awakens. A country of 1.4 billion people, of sprawling cities, of a massive economy, the most extensive road network in the world, and the world's largest car industry. Welcome everyone to episode 39 of the Automotive History series. And in this three-part episode, it's about the history of the Chinese car industry. An auto industry too big to ignore. And this is part one, Communist Creations. Allow me to introduce you to the current day Chinese car industry by just throwing some facts and figures around. The Chinese car industry is currently the largest car industry in the world by automobile unit production. China's annual car production exceeds that of the United States, Japan and the European Union. Combined, China makes more cars than effectively the rest of the entire world. Currently, there are over 250 car companies to choose from, and I doubt you can name no more than five. These are some mind-boggling statements, yet we don't know it. We don't hear a lot about what China is up to. And yet here it is, the sleeping giant. How did the industry become so enormous? Should you be worried? To better understand this all, let me shine a light on it by telling you its history. At the start of the 20th century, China was still an empire under rule of an emperor and the first car to hit the Chinese soil was purchased in Hong Kong in 1901 and given to an empress. The car was an American-made Duraya Sare. Unfortunately, the empress could not enjoy the car for very long, uh, partly because she died after a couple years after receiving the car, but also because of other reasons. At this point in time, China was stuck in the old ways. The greatness of the empire had faded and people overthrew the Qing dynasty during the 1911 revolution. A year later, China had established itself as a republic with a provisional president and a small group of ruling officials. Around this time, European and American car makers slowly invaded the country. The Eastern politicians had an appetite for Western luxury goods, and companies like Mercedes-Benz and the Ford Motor Company found their way into Shanghai. But of all the brands, interestingly, the American Buick was the most favored by the elite. One reason I could find is that the Chinese do not wish to flaunt their wealth, which could be the reason they preferred an understated Buick over an intention-gramming Cadillac. And this love for Buick continues to this very day. The creation of the New Republic didn't do China any favors. The 1910s and 1920s are seen as a period of unrest. By a lack of a strong central government, many local leaders took their piece of the pie and became so-called warlords. And domestic battles lasted well into the late 1920s. And I hope you can understand that during this period, a strong national car industry wasn't top priority. Still, by the 1930s there was some development on the horizon. A prototype was made that would become the very first Chinese-made vehicle. A freight truck called the Ming Sheng, and a logical move considering China's mostly consist of agricultural industry. Unfortunately, the truck would never be built. Around the time the development was finished and the production would commence, the Japanese invaded China, and in 1937 the Second Sino-Japanese War had started. This war is considered to be the beginning of the Second World War in the Far East, and after the attack on Malaya and Pearl Harbor by Japan, this war evolved to become the Second World War. For China, the Second World War ended after the Japanese surrender, only for a new war to start. A civil war that would eventually overthrow the nationalist government and ended with the Communist Revolution in 1949, led by Mao Zedong. The People's Republic of China was born. By the start of the 1950s, almost the entire world wanted to forget the atrocities of the war and move forward by rapidly modernizing the society, industry and economy. Most countries did this by taking a right turn and modernized the country through capitalism and consumerism, but some other countries took a literal left turn and wanted to modernize the country through communism and collectivism, including China. 
Mao had a plan. In order to rapidly modernize China and develop new high-tech industry, it first had to redevelop its current main industry, agriculture. In 1953, Mao launched the first five-year plan that would completely overhaul agriculture and it was of course backed by the Soviet Union. And that brings us to the very first actual production vehicle of China. Mind you, production vehicle, so not passenger car. The Jaifeng CA-10, a freight truck heavily based on the Russian Ziz 150 in 1956. The truck was made by the newly founded First Auto Works, or FA, as I like to call it. Considering that the truck market was covered for now, and that the first five-year plan was a moderate success in modernizing agriculture, Mao felt overconfident in his next step, called the Great Leap Forward, which would now revolutionize heavy industry and steel production. And for the longest time, a car industry was largely ignored, but it was the hobby horse for many Western countries, and China should have it as well. Leading up to the creation of China's very first passenger car, there were already various small-time Chinese assemblers that wanted to make their first car, without any help from the government, but they had no clue how they should do it. The only point of reference they had were cars from the Western world, namely European and American. And so these companies decided to simply copy and mimic their design, but add a little Chinese twist to it, as it was forbidden to make anything that looked too much like it was coming from the Western world. Let me just show you some of these cars. For instance, you had this car, called the Heiping No. 1, made by the Taijin Auto Repair Works and looks with a bit of an imagination like a 1956 American Plymouth. Or what about these two, the Xijin 71, that have a touch of American Packard in them? And what about this one, the Dengta N101, that looked like a 1956 Dodge that had shrunk into wash? But alas, these were short-lived efforts, with only a couple cars or prototypes made. Because what is the first true Chinese-built passenger car? This one right here. The 1958 Dongfeng CA-71, built by Fa, the company that also brought to you the very first freight truck I talked about earlier. And here is where it gets interesting. The design of the Dongfeng is decidedly that of a British Ford console, with some American, European and Russian design elements thrown in there for good measure, but with some unique Chinese design gimmicks. The hood ornament, for instance, is a dragon, it had Chinese characters on the side, and the tail lights were designed after Chinese lanterns, and I think that's the coolest thing ever. It certainly is unique, and who says that the Chinese can make something original? Now, whereas other countries had a strong desire to make a people's car, think Volkswagen Beetle, think Fiat 500, the People's Republic did not have this desire. Far from it even. The Dongfeng wasn't even seen as the car that would mass mobilize the Chinese. This 70 horsepower fella was regarded as a luxury car, developed for Mao's personal use. And that was a problem. Other world leaders would look at it and say, <laughs> nice try Mao, but that's a Fort Gonzo. Better luck next time. And these are the same world leaders that drove in American Lincolns and Cadillacs, European Rolls Royces and Mercedes, and Soviet Zills and Chaikas. All very big and luxurious cars. China had to step up their game. And they did. In the same year, Fa also released the Honky CA-72. Honky meaning red flag. The car was a rush job, as the party's officials wanted to show the car in 1959, to celebrate 10 years of communist regime. This massive car had the length of a Cadillac, was heavily based on the American Imperial, imported a couple years prior, and featured a design similar to the 1956 Chrysler. Under the hood, a Chrysler Hemi V8 tried to pull this almost 3-ton beast up to speed. A car that was the true symbol of communism, and surely a rejection of capitalism. Besides the Dongfeng and the Honki, there was a third car released around the same time by Fa, but wouldn't go into production until the mid-60s, the Shanghai SH 760. This car had a body strongly inspired by mid-50s Mercedes-Benz and featured a 1955 Plymouth front end. Production of these cars was slow, everything was hand-built, and the assembly was described as chaotic. Some body parts already rusted before being painted, 
but that didn't matter anyway, because the metal was so thick, the body would outlive the engine and the transmission. Hmm, go figure. The stage was set. Communism in theory means everybody has a little something, but as usual, it turned into I have a bit more than you. And this was also the case with cars. The average Chinese was not even given the slightest chance at owning a car in his or her lifetime. But the party officials, hmm, now they could have some fun. As the 60s rolled around, more Chinese car companies started to build cars in very limited numbers. These companies were based in some of the largest cities in China and are currently the big boys of the Chinese car industry. A company based in Beijing, today known as BAW or BA, made the Dongfeng Hong, meaning the East is Red. BJ 760 compact sedan, based on Soviet architecture. It was essentially a reworked Volga, and was accompanied by larger and more luxurious CB4, which had a decidedly American design. By the mid-60s, the relations between China and the Soviet Union started to go downhill, and the Soviets slowly pulled out of China, and it had to rely on itself from that point onwards. Car production was still at an all-time low, only a couple hundred cars a year were made, although some 50s cars gained a fresh and modernistic design that, to be fair, looked quite on par with the rest of the world. But these cars were still exclusively for the great leaders and the party officials, so much even that it was regulated which official would drive which car. By the late 60s, there was a heavy resistance inside China to anything foreign. The entire import market was closed off with ridiculous import tariffs, and there was a strong pressure to develop cars within China by the Chinese than to import a foreign capitalist model, to deconstruct it and then learn from it. Basically, Chinese car makers had to figure out for themselves how to make a car. Do it! Just do it! Yes, you can! This slowed down car production to an all-time low at the start of the 70s. It was described as an industrial backwardness. Slowly, China came to terms that it had to make deals with foreign parties to encourage domestic industrial development. Despite their cult relations, some Chinese already got a taste of the quality of Japanese trucks and cars, and the country slowly opened up one step at a time. Most notably, Toyota took advantage of this by selling a selection of trucks and cars, but above all, offered technical support and expertise. Other companies from Europe and Japan followed by exporting trucks, except the United States, which of course was a bad word. After the death of Mao Zedong in 1976, the whole attitude towards the rest of the world softened even more. There was a shift from planned economy to market economy. This led to a rise in foreign car imports. Oh, sorry, did I say a rise? I mean a straight-up explosion. In 1977, 52 cars were imported, and only three years later, in 1980, it were a whopping 19,570 cars. And this was only the start. For instance, China had let go of the 260% import tariff on the Hainan Island. The result? A vehicle binge. In 1984, over there, officials imported cars like there was no tomorrow and made some nice cash off of it by selling them for ridiculous prices back to mainland China, where the import tariff was still active. Finally, more people got a rare taste of how good Western cars were compared to the backwater cars made in China. But this was far from ideal. By the mid-80s, China imported more cars from the outside than they produced themselves inside the country. Car ownership among the average Chinese was still historically low. And this faced China with a tough challenge. They want to develop their own car industry, but they can't do it on their own. They need foreign companies in order to succeed. But at the same time, China also doesn't want to be flooded by foreign car makers. Is there any solution to this problem? Yes. Yes, there is. But I'm not gonna tell you. Not yet. This was part one of this three-part episode about the history of the Chinese car industry. In part two, I'll reveal what the solution is and how the car industry further developed, roughly from the 1990s into the 2010s, a time notorious for the many copycat cars. Stay tuned.